Thanks, Dr. Well. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to basically paint the picture of where we are now with awake surgery and or local anesthetic surgery. Um, I'm going to paint the picture over three sort of episodes, pre-COVID, COVID, and post-COVID. I think I'm the first person to mention COVID, but it will be mentioned more times as we go along. Pre-COVID, rhinology was always challenging. We know that in the UK. I'm going to paint the UK picture in particular. Um, rhinology has always been a low priority procedure, and this is why I've been very excited with this technology. It, it gives us more opportunities to be cost-effective. Cost but in essence, for me, like everything else, pre-COVID was always about capacity and trying to move away from general anesthesia into local anesthesia. So in the UK, we do majority GA cases for rhinology, and that's how it happens. But we are slowly transitioning, as Dr. Wells has said, into local anesthesia. But for that, you need dedicated procedure zones. And I'm based at UCLH, London, and we have a dedicated procedure zone especially built for this because of, like everything else, canvassing the situation and, and realizing that this can be the future of what we call rhinology surgery with balloons. As, as well as that, the problem we also had pre-surgery was the fact that capacity was not great, funding was diminishing, and by 2019, all the fantastic stuff we did leading up to 2016 with reducing waiting lists, etc were diminishing so by 2019 pre-covid we had a waiting list of about 4 million people and about 10 percent of that was ENT and equally we were not hitting our targets with regards to seeing patients within 18 weeks so things were slightly getting worse towards 2019 and even then we saw the opportunity of awake surgery for rhinology then then bang covid came along now what covid did was reset everything, everything came to a massive halt. Waiting lists started going up again. We didn't operate for three months in the UK, and then I got a phone call from the government saying, Peter Andrews, would you like to be the Pan London NHS England lead for the recovery service? And I thought, as I nodded my head that way, yes, of course, it'll be an honor, right? So my role for the last 12 months has been looking at ways to recover ENT. And in rhinology, I see awake surgery as a real opportunity because you're operating in a different facility to general anesthesia. You're taking patients away from that waiting list where they're clogged up. And on that waiting list, if you've been involved with the UK prioritization, rhinology, unfortunately, is in the bottom. So what we're looking at now is new ways of working, and it's starting to really create momentum. We're not where the US are at the moment, but we are heading in that direction. And, and it's an important comment to come across to you because this is how you sell the story of awake surgery. You know, you're taking um, operations off that waiting list and you're treating patients sooner and more effectively because it's all about the patient. But how do we really embed this? Now in the UK, the biggest problem is this dichotomy between diagnostic clinics and surgical clinics, right? So in ENT, generally we mix it all together. So the big challenge moving forwards is having diagnostic clinics outside secondary care and placing them in the community, where patients can be seen sooner, more effectively, get their scans, get their nasal endoscopies, get their skin prick test, get a diagnosis and start treatment then. And if that doesn't work, then get referred into your surgical clinic where you guys will see them in secondary care, let's say. Right? So that's the way forward, and that's where we're heading. And it has lots of pluses. The big plus, I think, for the UK is if a patient is seen in the community, gets a scan, and we'll talk about selection criteria later on, and you think that patient's appropriate for local anaesthetic, balloon, or turbinate surgery, or whatever, they go streamlined into the procedure zone or your awake anaesthetic facility. And the great thing about that is you create a new patient pathway, you get it signed off by your government, showing that it is cost effective. And this is where I think it all fits in quite nicely. Of course, the biggest second problem we have is workforce, massive problem in the UK, and it's a massive problem in Europe too. So what do we do with the workforce? Well, the great thing about wake surgery is that you can bring on other allied professionals, train them up, and help facilitate that. So you're not drawing people away from GA elective operating theatres. You're creating your own workforce, which is very um, exciting. So in essence, 
it's a real, it's a real solution to the problem. And, in, and where I am concerned, and the way I'm pushing it, and the way I'm selling it, um, NHS England are on board, and they see this as an opportunity, as a real transformational pathway. So just moving forwards, what did we do? What we did at the beginning as a group when COVID hit, and it's, it seems like a distant memory, but at the time it was quite frightening for everybody. We'll sit down and look at ways of how can we look at new ways of working, and we came up with this document, and this document is a recommendation for how to do awake surgery or surgery on rhinology under local anesthesia. We have it available for people who are interested. We got 12 authors on it, three are sitting there in front of me, um, two from the States as well, and we had about five roundtable forums, and we got together and we looked at best ways of treating patients under awake surgery, but more important, best ways of adopting Wake, awake surgery, because this is really what this is all about. How can I adopt this new way of working? And it looked at patient criteria, it looked at um, best procedures to be used, but also safety, ventilation, and other aspects. So it's a document I'd encourage you all to read just to get a feeling for how best to adopt awake surgery practice. So I'm going to briefly go over how awake surgery can help. We know that Clinically, it is as effective as conventional endoscopic sinus surgery. There are some good studies out there showing it, but you've got to select the right patients, like everything else. And as Dr. Wells mentioned, you've got to start your first cases under general anesthesia before you go down the local anesthetic route. But once you get your confidence going, it's really effective. And actually, the patients um, tolerate it, they're happy, they've been seen earlier, and it's a win-win, all right? But on the other side of this diagram is equally the managerial capacity aspect. It's a win-win there. So really, it's a really good story to tell, and I would encourage you to try to tell that story. So long-term impact of awake surgery. It's been divided into three areas of here, but for me, the most, most important impact is how we design future care. And in the UK, I'm heavily involved with new patient pathways, which have now been signed off by all our relevant societies. So ENT UK is our society in, in, in the UK. Then you've got the British Rhinological Society, the British Society of Facial Plastic Surgery. They've all been involved in signing off this new uh, endoscopic sinus surgery pathway. And in this pathway, we have purposely put awake surgical roots. So it's now being embedded, and it's been embedded through being proactive and trying to save rhinology during this recovery phase. And that's what's key, because what I don't want to see in the UK, and probably this could be expanded out to Europe, is being rhinology not being uh, necessarily funded. So we've got to act clever. We've got to look at new ways of working, more cost-effective ways of working, and this is it. I think this is the solution. Uh, it, it's, and it's definitely taken off in the States, without a doubt, and I think we're following suit. So that's generally the message. So, this is where I hand over to Peter Baptista.